and I trust that you will understand what we are attempting to do in these nights. We are going to talk to you about those groups of people with whom we have some very serious disagreements. We are not talking about someone that we disagree with on the mode of baptism. We're not talking about someone that we may disagree with about the elements of the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about people that have some very, very serious differences with those of us who call ourselves missionary Baptists. How do we define a cult? There are several things that I think will tell you that this or that group is a cult. The first thing that you need to look for in a cult is some kind of extra-biblical authority. You will find that they will have a Book of Mormon. They will have a divine principle by Moon. They will have a book by Mary Baker Eddy or Ellen G. White that they revere and look to for guidance. And they will accept those writings even when they contradict the Bible. You will find that a cult will have a low view of the doctrine of salvation by grace. Every cult will inculcate the teaching of salvation by works. Every cult will have a leader, some charismatic figure, that they look to as a figure that tells them how to act and how to live. That's how a man like Jim Jones could control the lives of hundreds of people to the point of actually getting them to drink poison and kill themselves in the jungles of Guyana. We're going to go into that, and I'm going to tell you that there are other cults that are causing many suicides, and I'll document that before we are over uh, uh, through with these series. Every one of these has a low view somewhere of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, let me turn your attention to the Scriptures. Tonight we're going to discuss the Seventh-day Adventists. Probably the most widely known book on Seventh-day Adventism is the book written by Dr. Walter Martin on the truth about Seventh-day Adventism. Walter Martin is a cult specialist, and in this, Walter Martin has taken the position that the Seventh-day Adventists are just another denomination, and he has removed the onus of cultism in his thinking from the Seventh-day Adventists. I disagree strongly with Walter Martin on that particular issue. I think that he is wrong, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But let me direct your attention for just a few minutes to Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. Howbeit, then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. If you are acquainted with the book of Galatians, you know that Paul, in writing this, was terribly disturbed at what had happened in the churches of Galatia. He had come and he had preached of the marvelous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in preaching of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, people had turned from sin, and they had accepted the Lord. 
And then there had been a group of people that had come along claiming to be also Christians. They were from the Jerusalem church, and they were Judaizers. They said, yes, this salvation by grace business is fine as far as it goes. But that isn't sufficient. You need now to keep that salvation by participating in the works of the law. Your men and boys need to be circumcised. You need to keep the Mosaic law if you are going to remain saved. Paul said, who has bewitched you? Who put the evil eye on you? Who has led you astray into such ridiculous, uh, such a ridiculous position as that? And yet, beloved, that's exactly what we are faced with tonight. We are faced with a group of people that are insistent that you must keep portions of the Mosaic Law or you are not to accept or expect the favors of God. Now, how did all of this get started? It starts with a man by the name of William Miller. William Miller, <coughs> William Miller was an agnostic. He came to Christ, and in his early Christian life, he had a King James Version of the Bible and a Cruden's Concordance. And he began to study the Bible with no formal theological education whatsoever and began to propose certain things that he found in the Scripture. He said that, according to the book of Daniel, he believed that Jesus was going to return on March 21st, 1843. Now, it's perfectly obvious, isn't it, that that didn't happen. But he was not the only date setter. <laughs> Others have set dates. Other dates have come and gone. And, in fact, he went back to his figures when those dates uh, when that date uh, was not uh, in keeping with what happened. And he reset that date for October 22nd, 1844. And you see that that date also passed. Now it is to Miller's credit that at this point he dropped his preaching. He dropped his cultism. And he more or less faded from the issue. But in his following were certain people. One of them was a, name, a man by the name of Hiram Edson. Hiram Edson saw a vision. Always be careful of people that are seeing visions. Usually they need to cut down on cooked cabbage at night. But anyway... <coughs> He saw a vision. And in this vision, he saw the sanctuary that was to be cleansed was in heaven and not here on earth. And this, of course, led him to believe that the dates that Miller had set were correct. And by the way, let me remind you that the dates that Miller set are still part of Adventist doctrine. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Joseph Bates, a retired sea captain, one of this group, stressed that Saturday was the needed fulfillment of the fourth commandment. In fact, Ellen G. White was caught up to heaven. She saw the Ten Commandments, and she saw a halo around the fourth commandment and was told that that was what was wrong on this earth, was that people were not obeying the fourth commandment. Ellen G. White claimed the gift of prophecy. 
Your pastor recently was in Europe with a number of Adventists, and they uh, gave him books by Ellen G. White and uh, told him of uh, how they revered her writings. It is no secret. White Memorial Hospital in Los Angeles, when you walk in, the thing that uh, you see is an overwhelmingly large uh, uh, oil painting of Ellen G. White. They revere her. And, of course, she is the one that claimed the gift of prophecy. However, if you check her prophecies, very few of them were accurate. Guesses would be more accurate than prophecies. In 1855, these different Adventist societies came together, and in 1860, they took the name Seventh-day Adventists. Now, the interesting thing is that they have always been very, very critical of other churches until recently. It has been in the last 20, 25 years that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has begun to seek acceptance. And they want to be just another denomination. But they have not renounced the writings of Ellen G. White. They have not renounced those criticisms of those of our forefathers that spoke out about salvation by grace. And so, beloved, the onus is on them. Where are the apologies for uh, the things that they have said about Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and the other uh, mainstream of the denominations of, of uh, Christendom. No, I am not uh, about to say that the Seventh-day Adventists are another denomination. And let me tell you why. They teach that Saturday is the mark of the beast. Now, do not misunderstand what I'm saying. They do not believe that uh, going to church on Sunday, as you do it now, is the mark of the beast. They teach rather this, that Saturday is the perpetual day of worship, and that there is coming a time when there will be blue laws passed. And these blue laws will order you to go to church on Sunday. And all other days of worship will be illegal. And when those laws are passed, those of us that are Baptists and those of us that are, uh, are Christians of other groups, when we go to church on Sunday, we will have then accepted the mark of the beast, and we will be eternally damned. But it will be once that there has been a test, and that test is that Saturday is no longer a day when they can legally go to church. In other words, they will have to sacrifice their lives to worship on Saturday. Well, beloved, let me tell you something. Saturday never was a day of worship. And it might as well just be said right out now. The Jews did not worship on Saturday. They worshiped on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. They worshiped every day. Amen. Saturday was a day of rest, not a day of worship. If you know anything about the sabbatical laws, you know that a person not only was <laughs> to rest on the Sabbath day, he was not to travel but less than a mile. How many Adventists do you know that go to church more than a mile away from their home? They just broke the Sabbath when they did that, folk. How many people do you know 
that are Seventh-day Adventists that keep the Sabbath year. Every seventh year, the land was to remain idle. And any crop that came up was to be plowed back into the soil, and that was the way that you rebuilt the soil. And the reason that the Jews went into 70 years of captivity is that they had for 490 years failed to keep the sabbatical year. Yes, I understand something about the Sabbath. And I understand that it was not a day of worship, per se. By the same token, let me remind you, study the Old Testament as hard as you will, and you will not find anywhere that they had a synagogue service in the Old Testament. That was a tradition that rose among Jews during the Babylonian captivity. It is not of divine origin. It is of Jewish tradition that they worshipped on Saturday and had Saturday services in their synagogues. The person that tries to make Saturday a day of worship and a test uh, of whether I have or have not been saved is silly on the face of it. Now, the second thing that I want you to understand is that they revere Mrs. White's writings and equate her inspiration with that of the writers of the Bible. We're going to deal a lot with this this week. We believe that the Bible is the verbal plenary, inspired, inerrant Word of God. We believe that in the original autographs, there is no such thing as an error. You know, there are people that will tell me, well, the Bible's all right when it talks about spiritual matters. We believe that the Bible is inspired when it talks about the religious life. But when it talks about history and geography and culture, we can find that there are cultural errors, geographical errors, historical errors. You know what those people are saying? That God is a great theologian, but he's not so sharp on those other things. You see, my friends, I don't accept that. I think God knows as much about geography as some of the seminary professors I've met. I know that he knows as much about culture. And some of these critics that I know. God doesn't make mistakes, folks. And His Word, now I'm not defending a translation of the Bible. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying that the Word that God spoke through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the writers, those words were chosen under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and there is no mistake. Amen. All right, when somebody like Joseph Smith, Ellen G. White, Mary Baker Eddy, some of these people come along and say, Now here, I'm going to speak by inspiration. Check them out, folks. God gives you a way of checking them out. Test their prophecies. And if a prophecy that they have spoken does not come to pass, then that person has not spoken in the name of the Lord. When Herbert W. Armstrong predicted that 
Jesus was coming in 1975. You know better than that now. And anybody that follows Herbert W. Armstrong is a nut. You spell that with a capital N. All right, but what about the people that heard Ellen G. White make prophecies about the Civil War? Make prophecies about things that were happening in their day that did not come to pass. Any person that is acquainted with the writings of Ellen White and the true history of this nation knows that she missed it time after time after time. Even Walter Cronkite has a better record than she does. <coughs> I wouldn't say after the way Iran has gone, I don't know if anybody in Washington's got enough sense to know what's going on right now. I'd hate to try to be a prophet right now and then uh, try to tell what's going on. President last week said the Bakhtiar government's going, they don't even know where the man is now. Goodness. Wouldn't you hate to be depending on Jimmy Carter to take care of you right now? <laughs> they revere her writings. Don't revere anybody's writings. I don't care who it is. I don't care what a great Baptist so-and-so is. He'll make mistakes. Amen. I don't care how much you love this preacher or that preacher. He'll make mistakes. But God's prophets, God's Word doesn't make mistakes, folk. And people that claim that they are speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit of God and make mistakes are liars. Amen. And you put that down. And remember it. Now, this is what really bugs me. They believe that Satan has a part in salvation. And so says, ah, what do you mean? All right. Now, folks, let's go back in our thinking. The high holy day of the Jewish calendar was the Day of Atonement, Yom on that high and holy day, there were two animals that were used. One animal was called the scapegoat. On that animal, the hands of the priest were laid symbolically. And in that symbolic laying on of hands, the sins of Israel were laid on that scapegoat. It was driven into the wilderness, never, at least in type, to be seen again. He carried the sins away. The other animal was slain, and the blood of that animal was used to cleanse the temple and uh, the tabernacle and the temple. And then it was taken into the Holy of Holies once a year and put on the mercy seat. Now, beloved, the animal that was slain to the Adventist is the Lord Jesus Christ. But the scapegoat is Satan. And they believe that our sins are going to be laid on Satan. And he will bear our sins away. The Azael is a picture of Satan in Adventist theology, and that's wrong. Jesus Christ died for my sins. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He paid the price with his blood, but he bore them away in his person as well. And I refuse to accept anybody 
telling me that the avail, the scapegoat, is anything but a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, as you go, well, you couldn't have two animals picture the same. Oh, yes, you could. Look at how many offerings it takes to picture the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't understand the many facets of the uh, work of the Lord if you try to tell me that you couldn't have two animals and them represent the person of the dear Lord. That's why I believe that they have a low view of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> They believe in soul sleep. When a person dies, he goes to sleep in the grave. I don't believe that. I believe that when I die, that I will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I believe that the Bible teaches that. The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible teaches me that Paul was in a strait betwixt two. He didn't, uh, he, he had to make a decision. Uh, it's better for me to stay here and, and serve you, but for me it would be better to go and be with the Lord. Now listen to me, folks. <laughs> Here are people that are telling all over that, no, no, that's not so. But you see, they have Scripture. After all, what does First Thessalonians say? Them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. What does it say in First Corinthians chapter 15? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and so forth. Yes, my friend. When Jesus died, he tasted physical death for me. So when my body is placed in the grave, it has literally gone to sleep. My body. And it will be raised and united with my soul, my spirit, if you please, when Jesus returns. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Jesus to return. In a moment, by the way, that word is the word atom in the Greek language. That means the smallest indivisible, without cutting, that's what... The word atoma means, without any more cutting. That's how fast you're going to be with the Lord. In a twinkling of an eye, the flutter of an eyelid, you'll be in the presence of the Lord. And mortal shall put on immortality. Those of us that are walking here in this world, we are in our mortal bodies. And suddenly we will be immortal. But my father who died a Christian, my mother who died a Christian, they have corrupted bodies in graves. And this corruption shall put on incorruption, and it shall be brought to pass. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? You see, if Jesus comes tonight, I will say, yeah, <laughs> you never did get your stinger in the me. But my mother and my father and my brother will say, Grave, you didn't win. You didn't have the victory. We're in Jesus' presence. Body and soul. But you see, there are people that don't have that hope. <laughs> they go to a graveyard and they think that that's all there is. Oh, no. Not so. Not so. They believe in the annihilation of the wicked. 
I remember discussing this with an Adventist one time, and I said, how in the world can you comprehend, or how can you defend such a position? Everlasting life. Everlasting punishment. Well, that just means it lasts as long as it lasts. Now, that's silly, folks. Do you believe that you're going to live forever? The word is Ionion. The same word is spoken of about punishment. Everlasting Ionion punishment. God chose the same word to express those that are going to heaven will have everlasting life and those that are separated from God because of their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everlasting punishment. Now, they make a great deal out of this argument. Where in the Bible does it say $10,000 reward for immortal souls? Show it to me anywhere in the Bible. Well, it's just not there, folks. <laughs> you know, that's like a, a Jehovah Witness coming up. I'll need ten thousand dollars. Show me the word Trinity in the Bible. Now, folks, there are a lot of things taught in the Bible that the words are not there. For instance, we teach the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Find that word in the Bible. But you're not a Christian if you don't believe it. <laughs> See? Oh, don't get hung up on semantics. The Bible teaches that I will live forever. And I accept the Word of God. Now, as I told you, the Seventh day Adventists changed the teaching about the coming of Christ to the earth in 1844. But what they decided was this, was that Christ entered the sanctuary in heaven in 1844 and there made the atonement and began to make an investigative judgment to find out who was worthy and who could go to heaven. And since that time, Christ has been performing the investigative judgment. Now, beloved, the Bible says that he entered once. And he made the atonement once. Amen. And I don't have any idea that he waited until 1844 to do it. Anybody that tries to figure out all of these uh, dates by the book of Daniel are engaging in sheer, utter nonsense. But you see what you have to do? You have to say, well, this uh, year means a... Uh, uh, this, this day means a year, and uh, then we pick up this year back here, and pretty soon you can do anything you want to. Have you ever seen these guys that uh, can tell you who the Antichrist is? I've seen them work 666. Uh, to be Hitler, Mussolini, you know. As long as I make up my own uh, numerical formula, folks, I can, I can make John Penn the Antichrist. Amen. Or Martin Tanner or anybody else, as long as you just let me uh, set up the rules. But you see, that isn't the way you study the Bible. Oh, I believe that this means this and this means this and so out comes this. Christ died for our sins. He went into the Holy of Holies according to the book of Hebrews and there once for all made the sacrifice Amen. for sin. Now, they are Arminian in the very extreme. I don't know if you understand, but there are two classes in the religious world. Those who believe in eternal security are called Calvinists. Those who believe in falling from grace are called Arminians. And they're all shades of those two different positions. But there are Arminians that 
believe that you have to go a great length to great lengths before you lose your salvation. But Seventh day Adventists live in fear all the time that they will have gone over the line and will have lost their salvation. My friends, the grace of God. absolutely forbids anything like works. Don't you understand that if God saved me by His grace, it would not be grace if He said, I'm going to zap you if you don't behave yourself. That's not grace, folks. They don't understand what grace is. Grace is undeserved, unmerited, unconditional favor from God. Amen. And they don't understand that. And I feel very sorry for them. Now, there are many fine things that can be said about them. Their moral conduct and their high standards. If you know Seventh-day Adventists, you know that I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I've had uh, several doctors who are Seventh-day Adventists. Southern California, one of our finest medical institutions, uh, is run by the Seventh-day Adventists. And, uh, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, uh, Richard Nixon and I use the same doctor, and I'll wash my mouth out as soon as I get home, but anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Krauser is a Seventh-day Adventist. My grandmother was his very first patient, as a matter of fact. But be that as it may, let me, let me say this. Good works does not make you a good Christian. They have about a million, 150,000 members in their worldwide organization. They sponsor the Voice of Prophecy broadcast. Presently, they have about 860 stations carrying this. They have a very large per capita giving. Every year, as I check the various denominations in their giving, the Adventists are right at the top. They're very liberal in their giving. Now, don't misunderstand where I pastored. Every member of the church that I pastored tithed. Some of them gave it to the church, some to the doctor, some to the police. But all of them tied. <laughs> but it seems like the Adventists, they, they uh, give it to the church a little better than some of the Baptists that I passed for. They maintain hospitals and medical schools. In fact, in uh, Loma Linda, California, they have one of the finest uh, hospitals. One of my friends recently had open heart surgery there, and uh, he received the very best of care. Now, I used to say they never had pioneered any mission field, but I learned that that's not so. There is one mission field that the Seventh-day Adventists did pioneer. It's in the Pitcairn Islands. I think most of you have read the Mutiny on the Bounty and the survivors of the bounty. They're, they're the people that are the issue of those survivors of the bounty have been reached by the Seventh-day Adventists. And out of Glendale, California, they conduct uh, radio programs and so forth uh, toward those people in the pit carriage. But that's the only mission field they have ever pioneered. Now, what do they do? They come to where Baptists have gone or uh, where other missionaries have gone. They say, oh, yes, uh, that's wonderful. We're just glad that you've heard about Jesus Christ, but It reminds me of billy goats. They butt you to death. You ever, you ever have a, a, a fellow that comes out and says, he's such a nice preacher, but... They didn't tell you all of it. This salvation by grace is fine as far as it goes, but now you need to keep the law of Moses. You need to... Keep the Sabbath day, and you need to leave off pork, and you need and the, the dietary laws, and so forth. Now, let me tell you something, folks. 
I heard an illustration. This man said that law and grace were like two oars on a rowboat. And he said, if you just pull at one oar, you go around in the circle. Grace works law. But he said, you have to pull at both oars. And I thought, what a wonderful illustration if you plan to go to heaven in a rowboat. <laughs> but if you plan to go to heaven according to the Bible, you're going to have to repent of your sins, you're going to have to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to have to receive Him as a propitiation for your sins and trust Him completely. Now, beloved, He will change your life. And He can, you know. There was a woman that was brought to Jesus, and she was a terrible woman. In fact, she was so <coughs> impious that she was practicing her prostitution publicly. They brought that woman to Jesus, and they said, We have taken this woman in the very act of adultery. Now, that's pretty flagrant, folks. What do we do? You remember the story. But what about the woman? Jesus said to that woman, Go and sin no more. But my friends, wait a minute. Here's a woman that all of her life has been a terrible sinner. A woman that was so immoral that she would actually carry on publicly in an adulterous way. What did Jesus say to her before he said, go and sin no more? Uh -huh. Where are thine accusers? He said, I don't condemn you. He had removed her condemnation. He had saved her. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Beloved, until Jesus removes the condemnation, he came to seek and to save. He came to remove that condemnation. And when he does, even a woman that is so mean and so fine that she would practice sin like that, he could tell her, you can go away now. And you can live a clean, decent life. Because I've changed you. I've changed. Oh, beloved, that's the kind of Christ I serve. That's the kind of Christ we preach. That's the kind of Christ we believe. We believe that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, He makes a difference. And we don't have to go around the people and sneak around and try to get our books into their hands by some devious means. They'll do that to you. They'll come and say, oh, these are children's books. And they're Adventist books. Filled with Adventist doctrine. D.M. Canwright and E.B. Jones were leaders among the Seventh-day Adventists. But after years, after Bible study, they awakened to the doctrines that they were teaching. And broke and wrote at great length about the errors of Seventh-day Adventism. If anybody is a Seventh-day Adventist, I would advise you to read